Is religion dying? Is religion declining around the world? Or is our world getting more religious? And what is religion at all? These are some of the major debates in modern scholarship. And such questions are addressed in this upcoming book that will be published next month on May 9, 2023. It's written by Isabella Kesselstrand, Phil Zuckerman and Ryan Cragun under the title Beyond Tao, The Secularization of Society. Some reviewers claim that this book will be defining text on the undeniable proof that secularization theory is correct and here to stay. Or that the case that offers make, critics will find difficult to reject. This book will make a significant contribution not just to the sociology of religion, but to anyone interested in the role of religion in society today. My friends, this is Religiolog, and today I'm going to review this amazing book, and even if you are watching this video before May 9th, you already may pre-order it online. The link will be in the description. You'll hear the book's summary, its major claims, the core of the debate in modern scholarship about the issue of secularization, and uh, what evidence the authors present to challenge their opponents and to back up their own claims. At the end, as I normally do with my video reviews, I'll allow myself to express a bit of my personal opinion. Some of my subscribers know that Phil Zuckerman is on my dissertation committee, and I feel an ethical obligation to declare it. At the same time, I should state that it doesn't immediately make my review biased. Of course, just like everyone else, I am full of various biases, but I'll do my best in trying to be as objective as possible. So, without further ado, let's dive into it. And let me begin with the major claims of the book. Uh, first, secularization is possible and the demand for religion can decline. Moreover, we can observe it measure it and demonstrate that much of the world is markedly less religious today than it was in the past. The author state, We argue that since a statistically significant and substantively meaningful percentage of people living in nations all over the world are less religious than those of previous generations in terms of belief, behavior and belonging, secularization has occurred. I realize it may seem as a very bold and controversial claim, but we'll get into details soon. Secondly, the authors present what they believe uh, the evidence from over 100 societies around the world that support their claims. In third chapter, they focus on the case study of four countries, the US, South Korea, Chile and Norway. Third, they argue that religion is not something universal and inherent to humans and claim that secularity is just as natural to the human condition as religiosity. And that life lived without religion is not some aberrant and natural mutation, but a fully possible, natural and increasingly common reality. And finally, they try to demonstrate to the reader what secular life actually looks like or how non-religious people live their lives, raise their children, organize communities and deal with all kinds of issues in their day-to-day -day life. So, if you watch this video to the end, you'll be able to understand why Kaiserstrand, Zuckerman and Kregun believe that secularization is real, beyond a doubt. What set of evidence they provide to prove this point. How they revise the classic secularization theory and what elements they include in their modernized version of the theory what criteria they set for those who want to challenge their hypothesis, especially those who advocate for the change not decline paradigm, how they address cases that often presented as exceptions or counter-arguments against secularization, why humans are not born believers, and why the most important engine of religious ongoing maintenance and continued reproduction is socialization, and of course many more. So now let's unpack it a bit. First of all, the book is theory-driven, but is quite accessible even for a popular audience. Even if you aren't familiar with the academic debate over the secularization theory, no worries. The authors clearly explain what's the history of the debate, what are the arguments of different camps or sides of the dispute, and of course, while one camp wants to dismiss the theory completely, this book represents the secularization camp that believes that secularization is real. In other words, that religion is declining. Uh, but if so, what do they mean by religion and secularization? Of course, all these definitions are explained in detail in the book, along with uh, why it was and why it's still problematic to come up with good definitions. Uh, the authors also demonstrate the evolution of various debates over it, but here is their working definition of religion. 
the amalgamation of ideas, rituals, practices, symbols, identities and institutions that humans collectively construct based upon their shared belief in the supernatural. It's important to understand that the authors separate from the idea that, especially at the micro level, religious life consists of three interrelated dimensions – belief, behavior and belonging. And on the screen you may see what they mean by it. Offers admit that, of course, not everyone is religious to the same degree in all three dimensions. Uh, for someone, belief might be the central core of their religiosity, while for another, it might be mainly about performing certain behaviors. Or it could be more about belonging to some tradition. Uh, for someone else, uh, two out of three might be significant, and so on. I hope you've got the main idea. And now, uh, what is important is that if religion entails these three dimensions, then secularization would entail, no surprise, a social process in which fewer people over time believe in supernatural claims, fewer people engage in religious behaviors, and fewer people belong to or identify with a religion. Or, if we move to chapter 1, offers provide us with formal definitions of secularization and modernization, because secularization, in their opinion, is tied to modernization. Actually, it's their key argument. Countries have to be developed and have religious freedom, otherwise they don't expect secularization. The simplified concept is that modernization creates problems for religion. But if we unpack, here again are the formal definitions of secularization and modernization. And their core proposition would be, the more modernized a society and its institutions and individuals are, the greater the likelihood of secularization. But before we move on into the evidence for secularization, it's important to understand how the authors revise the classic theory and after addressing the critique from the opponents, how they understand secularization now. And here I do understand that for some of my viewers it may be too boring to listen to all this theoretical stuff. If so, there are time codes in the description, so feel free to move on to the section regarding the evidence for secularization, or regarding debunking the claim that religion is something inherent to humans while non-religion is unnatural, or conclusions, or critique, whatever you're here for. But I'll continue with the theory. While admitting that the opposite camp in their critique of the theory suggests some good points, Beyond Doubts shows why the opponents are wrong in their concluding assumptions. For example, one of the main claims uh, of the opposite camp is that demand for religion doesn't change. People need religion, they really do, and if we see some signs of religious decline in a given society, it's because the religious organizations are too lazy, they are not doing a good enough job meeting the human's demand for supernatural compensation. Of course, the authors of Beyond Doubt disagree with such claim. They provide the reader with tons of academic works and journalistic reports from the previous decade that argue the opposite. Another objection is that some scholars have argued that uh, what we witness is actually not a decline of religion, but rather a change in the way religion is expressed. Uh, to that, the authors of Beyond Doubt say, well, yes, religion mutates and transforms over time. Uh, for instance, less people believe in a personal God, but may instead believe in some sort of higher power. Yet, we have evidence of decline in all such dimensions, and therefore religious change is not a contradiction to, but rather a key element in secularization process. Next, the authors admit that they have to rely on limited snapshots of available data. Therefore, it's problematic to come up with a holistic picture. Yet they state that those are more uh, the shortcomings of social science in general, not of secularization theory. The methodology always has its limitation. However, they are confident that uh, today they have better data and more of it available than ever before. And what's important, they state that when possible, they enrich the findings of quantitative research with qualitative data. What in my opinion is extremely important, but more on that later. Uh, also, they offers remind that secularization theory contains two separate kinds of claims. Uh, one is descriptive, that is uh, an assertion that religion declines, but the other is explanatory, when we try to explain why religion is weakening and fading. 
And while one can agree that religion is declining, uh, they could disagree with the explanation why it happens. Uh, another important thing is that secularization does not require the complete disappearance of religious beliefs or the total absence of religious behaviors or the full erasure of religious belonging. Instead, it is sufficient to describe it as a weakening, lessening, diminishing or fading of this in a given society over time. And finally, secularization is not inevitable, but merely possible. The authors don't believe that religion is somehow inevitably fated to die. Uh, no, it simply can decline and sometimes dramatically. In fact, uh, they believe it already has. Uh, however, it refers only to modernized societies. And again, this is one of the key elements of their version of secularization theory. So, uh, another important concept that every reader is expected to understand is that secularization is a combination of two elements. Uh, differentiation and rationalization. Uh, by the way, it's just a simplified version of the theory. The comprehensive theory looks like this. As you may see, it includes religious pluralism, existential security, and childhood autonomy. And yes, uh, those of you who are familiar with Engelhardt's uh, religion's sudden decline uh, would find here some common features. Uh, by the way, about six months ago, I reviewed this book on my channel, so please take a look if you haven't yet, uh, the link will be in the description. The concept of religious pluralism is kind of clear, but the idea of socialization I'll discuss a bit uh, later while briefly covering chapter 4. Uh, that's why let's just unpack a little bit the simplified version of the theory. Uh, for the comprehensive model, you'll have to read the book. Differentiation the authors define as separation of religion from various aspects of societies, institutions or individuals. Uh, for example, many hospitals or universities, such as Harvard, were founded and run by religions, uh, but they secularized over time. And today, for instance, Harvard is far more likely to be associated with scientific advances than with uh, its divinity school. Uh, but the authors want to make sure that we don't conflate it. Differentiation is not secularization, as some scholars assume. They are not the same. It's a separate social process that can and often does lead to secularization. This way the proposition would be next. The greater the differentiation at the societal, institutional or individual levels, the more likely secularization is to occur. Now let's discuss the second component, uh, which is rationalization. Here's the definition. Rationalization is the ordering of society based on technological efficiency, bureaucratic impersonality and scientific and empirical evidence. The claim here is not that people are more rational or that religious individuals are irrational while secular are rational. Uh, no, simply more and more people today, for example when having some health issues, rely not on magic or prayers but on modern science and healthcare. Then the proposition that the author suggests uh, is kind of obvious. The more rationalization that exists at societal, institutional and individual levels, the greater the likelihood of secularization. And I hope you've noticed already that they often point to different layers of the process. That is because relying on Carol Dubillery, they demonstrate that secularization takes place at three levels. Macro uh, or societal level, uh, meso or institutional level and at the micro or individual level. And by providing an example with the education system, they explain how it works on all of the three levels. So again, the bottom line here is that differentiation and rationalization are the two elements of modernization that most directly contribute to secularization. Finally, before we move on into data, uh, I should note that the authors demonstrate good knowledge of counter-arguments or challenges that the opposite camp presents against the theory and they skillfully address them. Two of such uh, main challenges would be uh, the religious economist model by Rodney Stark and his colleagues and the idea that religion is not declining but changing or taking a different shape. Since the 1960s some scholars propose various models of why organized religion is declining. For example the idea of Lukman about the invisible religion or Grace Davy about believing without belonging or the idea of lived religion, or spirituality instead of lived religion, and so on. 
This part of the book is really fascinating and probably deserves a separate review. But in short, uh, they don't disagree with the above mentioned ideas, indeed religion is shifting and transforming. But Kesselstrand, Zuckerman and Craigun claim that while the change is obvious, the decline is obvious too. Uh, at this point, uh, the book gets really interesting. And those of you who are familiar with this very vital and controversial debate among scholars today must understand why. I'm not claiming that they completely destroy the hypothesis of advocates of change not decline argument, but they seriously challenge them by providing five quite solid reasons why even if the change occurs, it doesn't undermine or challenge secularization. But what is more important, uh, they suggest that either lived religion and spirituality advocates simply admit that there is change and decline simultaneously, or they must meet uh, six criteria listed in the book. In this review, I won't disclose uh, neither the above mentioned five reason, uh, nor the six criteria. But I will summarize by stating that Kesselstrand, Zuckerman and Craigun expect their opponents to come up with a serious theory, but not only empirical observations or description of what people believe and do. In other words, uh, they must challenge the secularization theory not only with qualitative data and not only on the micro, but also on the macro and meso levels. They expect their opponents to respond to what they believe the mountains of evidence that has accumulated in favor of secularization. The burden of proof has arguably shifted and now the advocates of the change not decline argument need to demonstrate that secularization is not occurring. Otherwise, it appears as though the change not decline advocates continue moving the goalposts indefinitely when new evidence of religious decline is presented. An objection that might come from the opposite camp is that the whole attempt to construct a macro theory is meaningless or out of fashion. We live in post-structural era and we must be very skeptical about any global theory uh, that attempts to describe or to predict some complex phenomenon. And religion is of course a very complex phenomenon. So is it even reasonable to initiate such an enterprise by trying to capture global processes if it will be hard to defend any macro theory? In any case, secularization doesn't play out the same way in every country, so why even try a broad theory? Uh, critics may remind that all societies develop differently and there is no such thing as a linear unidirectional system of development. To what Kesselstrand, Zuckerman and Craigun answer that they don't think of their theory to be macro but rather middle range theory. It's not a theory about all of societies but rather about one aspect of society which is religion. Uh, they compare it to democracy. Just as there are many ways that democracy develops, there are many ways that secularization plays out in countries. In a way the authors of Beyond Doubt even do some part of the homework for their opponents. They state that uh, secularization theory is uh, falsifiable and there are ways to illustrate that it's wrong. Moreover, they provide a mechanism that could disprove the theory. In other words, they are not uh, holding uh, onto it uh, like fanatically and are willing to follow the evidence. All they expect is for their opponents to provide such sufficient evidence against the theory. But until then, the bottom line is that secularization is a reality, Rodney Stark and his colleagues were wrong. And this is what they demonstrate in chapter 2. Here the authors uh, rely on cross-national survey data from the World Value Survey and the European Values Studies to demonstrate the spread of secularization and changes in religious belief, behavior and belonging in over 100 countries over the past 40 years. They admit that they are missing data on more than a third of the countries around the world. In addition, the variables to capture different processes of modernization are not ideal, yet satisfactory. Uh, regarding religious behavior, they argue that low levels of religious participation are clearly not exclusively a Western European or even a European phenomenon. For example, in 10 Eastern and Southern European countries, less than 25% of the population attends uh, religious services monthly. Outside of Europe, they name 13 such countries in Asia and Latin America. They admit that available data from the most religious African continent are sparse, uh, yet we may see uh, that Ghana and Rwanda uh, show small decline in monthly attendance, while in Ghana and Kenya there are established secularist organizations. 
regarding belonging, they were able to identify only 14 countries in Asia, Europe and South America uh, where a majority of people don't identify with any religion. Uh, there is also an obvious decline in Canada and the US and more modest decline in Mexico and Guatemala. In South America, all surveyed countries except Peru show evidence of diminishing religious affiliation. In Africa, it's Ghana and Rwanda. So again, it's not only a European phenomenon. And finally, what is more important is that the decline is obvious not only in regard to attendance and belonging, but also to belief. Because this is the main objection uh, they receive from the opponents. 34 out of 81 countries experienced decline on the believe in God scale, while many countries uh, didn't show any increase. The authors emphasize that what is also important is that uh, there are many non-European nations that demonstrate decline, not only in this, but in other dimensions of religiosity. And therefore, secularization is not a European phenomenon, it is a global phenomenon. And discussing levels of development and government regulation, they conclude, with no surprise, that countries that have freedom of religion and high level of development demonstrate more substantial secularization. So, the conclusion here is that the world isn't more religious than it has ever been, as some scholars uh, would argue. On the contrary, exactly as secularization theory predicts, most modern and modernizing countries demonstrate a decline in all three dimensions. And by the way, the United States is not an exception. In the third chapter, Beyond Doubt goes into a deeper analysis of Norway, Chile, South Korea and the US. Countries located on four different continents with highly distinct socio-cultural contexts. While having different religious backgrounds, they all allow freedom of and from religion and all have high or increasing levels of economic and human development. Norway is important here for a couple of reasons. First, it has the largest humanist association in the world uh, with over 100,000 members. Second, in 2012, the parliament voted to grant the Church of Norway greater autonomy, but after 10 years, uh, there were no signs of religious vitality. And those who are familiar with Rodney Stark's theory of religious economy would understand why it may serve as a counter-argument uh, to this theory. And finally, what also didn't happen is that people that left traditional religion did not turn into spirituality. In other words, alternative forms of belief don't replace conventional religion here. At the same time, Norway is the world's leading country in terms of economic and human development. The US and South Korea are interesting because uh, for a long time they served as counterexamples to disprove secularization. However, recent data demonstrates that there is a sharp decline in all aspects of religiosity. And in South Korea, not only among Christians, but also among Buddhists. According to 2018 survey, 55% of South Koreans are atheists what is considered extremely high. About 70% of young adults are atheists. Regarding Chile, among other important observations, the authors demonstrate that people are unlikely to become more religious as they age, as some scholars suggested. So again, if you are looking for the data in favor of secularization theory, chapters 2 and 3 is where you want to go. Let's move on. In chapter 4, the authors come up with four major claims. Uh, first, the historical record offers evidence that there have always been secular people going back thousands of years. There are currently hundreds of millions of secular people in the world today. Third, there are some societies in which the majority of population is secular. And fourth, there exists multi-generational evidence showing that religion reproduces itself through socialization. So, when children are raised secular, they almost always stay secular as adults. Before presenting their counter-arguments, the authors of the book uh, list many scholars who admit that uh, secularity is characterized as artificial, unnatural, almost unhuman mutation. To what the authors claim, we have plenty of evidence of secularity going back as far as we have written records of human socialization. This is important to stress because it uh, counters the myth that being secular is some uh, new artificial modern mutation. Sorry, but I'm not going to discuss this and the next chapter in detail here. 
Yes, both issues are indirectly associated with the secularization theory, but iDriver create a separate video on these two chapters. So if you'd like to hear more on that, uh, then please subscribe to the channel, click that bell icon, and you'll receive a notification when the next video will be out. In short, uh, it will be on the topic of whether religion is in our DNA, while irreligion is a natural. It also will cover the important topic of socialization, uh, which the authors claim to be uh, the most important engine of religion's ongoing maintenance and continued uh, reproduction, uh, meaning babies do not start out religious, uh, they have to be taught religion. And when these kids uh, grow up and have kids of their own, uh, the cycle is repeated or not. In other words, our parents strongly shape our religiosity or lack thereof. And the main idea from chapter 5 that I'll discuss in more detail in my next video has to do with the lifestyle of secular people. In other words, uh, what is it like to live a secular life, to raise children, to deal with crisis, uh, aging, and what the secular values and ethic looks like. Finally, in chapter 6, uh, the book concentrates on possible exceptions that opponents of the theory often bring to the banquet. At the same time, Kesselstrand, Zuckerman and Kregun claim that when properly understood, secularization theory is actually capable of explaining each of these scenarios. They are cultural defense, government restrictions or artificial religiosity, and forced secularization or artificial secularization. By cultural defense, they mean examples like Poland or Ireland. Despite experiencing modernization and rationalization, these countries are quite religious. The objection to the theory basically states that in societies where religion finds something else to do, other than serve its traditional roles and functions, secularization is less likely to occur. So Ireland and Poland served as classic examples. In both of these countries, there were external forces, the UK and the Soviet Union, that threatened the autonomy and the culture of the citizens. And religion, in both cases Catholic religion, became a cultural defense tool that people used to unite against the enemy. Uh, later, the authors add the United States into the equation and remind about the religious revival that occurred in America as a response to the godless communism of the Soviet Union. However, in all three cases, once religion was no longer required to defend local culture and values, secularization had advanced. And of course, in chapter 6 you may find all the necessary data and evidence for that. Another exception to secularization that some scholars have suggested is when government prohibit or penalize individuals for leaving the state religion. It applies to many predominantly Muslim countries where freedom of and from religion doesn't exist. 25 countries around the world have laws restricting whether someone can leave the dominant religion, in many cases with extensive prison sentences or death. But the authors of the book claim that such countries are actually excellent illustration of secularization theory, because they exhibit a very little differentiation between religion and other aspects of social life. Therefore, they fall within this mentioned above proposition. So, it may be the case that many people in those countries are already quite secular, but they will only admit it anonymously. For instance, the authors provide the result of one such study in Iran that suggests that there are plenty of secular people in Iran, or the Arab barometer that suggests that it is possible that the majority of young adults in these countries are non-religious. So, maybe secularization has begun in those places. And the third and last exception is the recently observed increase in religiosity in former Soviet countries. What happened here is forced secularization, when the government closed and destroyed almost all places of worship, they closed all seminaries and monasteries, imprisoned and killed lots of clergy. Under such conditions certainly some people would move away from religion, but many would simply pretend that they are non-religious government forcefully try to reduce the supply for religion. But what they've got is an artificial secularization. Based on the available today data, we know that the Soviet government failed to succeed with secularization. Many people were more religious than they reported. By the way, if you are interested in details, on my channel I have an amazing video review of the history of Soviet atheism by Victoria Smolkin. It consists of three episodes covering different periods. The link will be in the description.
So after the collapse of the Soviet Union, it comes as no surprise that the numbers went up. The authors also provide data to demonstrate that in former Soviet countries there was a rise of ethno-nationalism that advocated for an integration of religion with national identity, which undoes attempts to separate religion from other aspects of society. In other words, ethno-nationalism helped contribute to the rise of religiosity after the collapse of the Soviet Union. After analyzing Russia in more depth, authors declare that Russia is not an exception to secularization theory. To the contrary, it is a clear illustration of the theory. You cannot imprison, torture or murder religion away. It must be an organic, sociocultural process uh, that is aligned with modernization in relatively free, democratic society. That is what we find, for instance, in modern Canada, Uruguay, Germany or Japan. This way, all three scenarios do not actually challenge the theory, but serve to illustrate it. The authors remind their opponents that if they wish to demonstrate an actual exception of secularization theory, it would require a country with high levels of both differentiation and rationalization that is also extremely religious. We are unaware of any such countries, they conclude. Finally, Kesselstrand, Zuckerman and Kragun admit some limitations and suggest that the future research must be done to advance their findings. They admit methodological difficulties and the necessity to find more reliable ways to measure secularity on all three levels, especially meso or institutional level that has been ignored in almost all the research on secularization as well as in this book. They also admit that more thought needs to be given to how to operationalize modernization, including differentiation and rationalization. They strongly encourage scholars to consider better measures of this concept. In addition, they remind that there is available data for many other countries, but they chose to focus in detail only on four of them – the US, South Korea, Chile and Norway. Therefore, future research uh, should do as they did just for other countries. Now let's see what could be other possible limitations of the book and what their critics may say or simply what else could be done to improve the theory. First, it would be good to address the topic of why at least some rich people that live in highly modernized and secure environment are still practicing religion. What exact function religious beliefs, practices and attendance plays in their life and especially in lives of those with strong religious commitment. Another critique is that secularization is not only about decline in religious belonging, belief and behavior, but also about the social role or significance that religion plays in various societies. Religion could be viewed not only as a system of beliefs, but as a social structure. Sometimes we could measure a level of secularity of a given society and not by the change in the quantity of religious versus non-religious individuals, but by the role that religion plays in the life of a given society. And this is what critics of the theory would often emphasize. Uh, maybe regular practitioners losing their interest in religion, but why don't you take a look how the presence of religion in the media is growing? Take a look at what happened in Iran, Egypt, Afghanistan, Turkey, even the US. Religion is integrated in the politics, legislative system. We may see how religion could be a reactionary response to more liberal discourse. We see the rise of political parties around the world that employ religion to support their agenda. The influence of ultra-conservative groups on politics around the world is growing as well. Often those are people that prefer certainty versus uncertainty. And when religion or politicians give them simple answers, they will follow and it may take very ugly manifestations like restricting women's rights or take an example of anti-LGBT legislation in Uganda, making homosexuality punishable by death. Russia is another good example that embraces authoritarianism and ultra-conservatism deeper and deeper. Beyond doubt, of course, may remind about the second exception in the sixth chapter, uh, where they discuss the government restrictions or artificial religiosity. They could also remind about their criteria for secularization, it implies democracy, freedom of religion and modernization. Uh, to what some critics may still object by claiming that so many people around the world disgust democracy and prefer other forms of government. How confident are we that the popularity of democracy will not decline in the future? Therefore, such manifestation of the popularity of conservative and ultra-conservative groups on various dimensions of social life could be addressed in the book in more depth. 
uh, some may also point to a crisis of secular ideas, such as belief or trust in science, modernization or progress. Therefore, regarding differentiation, some critics may claim that, on the contrary, we see how religion integrates with politics, ideology, science, law and so on by creating some sort of post-secular hybrids. And because of such hybrids, when, for example, magic, science, Buddhism, politics and Christianity are mixed in one place, it becomes really hard to distinguish religious from non-religious. It gets harder to understand what is religion and what is not. Next point is, if modernization creates problems for religion, then how do we explain modernized version of religious cults around technology, such as a Christian Transhumanist Association, Mormon Transhumanist Association, the Church of Perpetual Life, such new religious movements as Rihalism or Scientology or various mindfulness movements such as Goyenka Vipassana or Maharishi and so on. All of them are very much pro-science. Often, adherents of such movements would claim to be secular, non-religious or even atheists. But do they fall under the category of secularize? Of course, those are just tiny minorities, but a better understanding of such groups may reveal some hidden elements that might challenge some of the assumptions of the theory. Often, the followers of such movements are extremely committed people, so a good qualitative analysis of such movements shouldn't be ignored. I see that the authors themselves acknowledge that religion is mainly about a set of established supernatural beliefs. That is why the debate is more over the issue of belief, not behavior or belonging. The authors realize that they should first and foremost address the religious individualization thesis, or what they call change not decline argument. It argues that modernization will change only the social forms of religion. People may stop attending religious institutions, but they may practice their faith individually and may still believe in all sorts of superstitions, astrology, power of amulets, ghost spirits and so on. And while acknowledging the methodological limitations of the World Value Survey and the European Value Study, and especially after promising to back up their quantitative data with qualitative data, some skeptics could expect a bit more of it. Uh, they could claim that to base the conclusion about the decline of belief on a scale of belief in God is a bit problematic. It may miss many non-theistic religions or practitioners of various shamanic or folk religions around the globe. Of course, such an approach may partially capture changes among adherents of theistic, mainly Abrahamic beliefs, but is obviously limited. Abrahamic traditions represent only slightly more than a half of the world's population. In Chapter 2, the authors acknowledge this limitation and promise to provide more detailed analysis and broader range of additional measures in Chapter 3, but some critics more likely would not find them satisfactory enough. Yes, the authors argue against the broad definition of religion and explain why it's important to set the boundaries. They demonstrate that the level of religious commitment might decline uh, when individuals practice their own or private version of spirituality. Yet, some may object uh, that it's not a strong argument against the disenchantment of the world hypothesis. Many people that are absolutely indifferent to religion or even hostile to it may live in a reality that implies the existence of magic and spirits. So it's really important to adjust our methodological tools so that we can get more reliable and honest results from our surveys. Please don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that offers completely ignore it. They realize these limitations and yet it may question the level of our confidence when we make claims regarding levels of religious beliefs. In the third chapter, authors rely on additional data from the International Social Survey Program that focuses on life after death, religious miracles, heaven and hell, and deceased ancestors. But how confident are we that among those 55% atheists in South Korea, there are no people that believe in omens, astrology, or the healing power of amulets? What if some of them understand atheism in a very narrow sense as simply denial of monotheistic God? Therefore, to minimize objections from critics, it is better to have additional data sets. In defense, the authors of course may say that they don't set the bar too high. All they need is to capture a slight decline in religiosity. It will be enough to confirm that the theory works. And indeed, we see the decline not only in belief in God's scale, but also in belief in religious miracles and afterlife. 
Therefore, those who would like to object against the methodological tools in Chapter 2 regarding belief must simply check our available data and they will find that decline is real. And finally, some critics may ask, uh, how could you claim that the world overall is becoming less religious if we see how religion is flourishing in some parts of the world? Both Christianity and Islam are growing in the global south. Also realizing how hard it is to get reliable data from China and by acknowledging the possibility of artificial secularization, similar to the one in the Soviet Union, it's hard to admit whether the global population in general is becoming less religious. A good qualitative study could reveal that there are many people in China who honestly consider themselves atheists because they really don't believe in God, but at the same time they would believe in astrology or would cover their mirrors to protect themselves from ghosts or other supernatural creatures. Just take a look how many Buddhist or Tao temples in China are always surrounded by crowds of people. Right now we simply don't have enough data, or we cannot trust the data that comes from China. But what if there are hundreds of millions of believers who are even more dedicated than those in the former Soviet Union? We simply cannot know. In any case, it would be really good if the proponents of secularization would have in their camp some scholars from the Global South, or experts not in Christian or monotheistic beliefs, but someone who is an expert in Hinduism or Native American, Chinese or various African folk religions. It shouldn't necessarily be sociologists or psychologists, but anthropologists or scholars of religion that focus on qualitative study of non-religion or apostasy between such non-Abrahamic cultures. In other words, it's good to have reliable qualitative data, especially from the global south, even if the authors don't expect secularization to occur there. The authors of Beyond Doubt are right to assume that there could be lots of hidden elements of what they call lived secularization in the regions with Muslim majority, but to convince the opponents it's good to have more data. And I'm not saying that Beyond Doubt gets it wrong. The book does a fantastic job and admits many of such problems. I'm just reminding that the job isn't done and better evidence uh, would help to improve the theory. I must also acknowledge that in some occasions, uh, beyond doubt, instead of addressing some uh, issues in depth, uh, simply refers uh, their reader to other works where they could find more coherent responses to their questions. So please pay attention to that while reading. Uh, we should always remember that there is a group of scholars that represent the secularization camp and their works overall don't contradict but rather complement each other by focusing on different aspects of secularization. For example, the recent book by Ronald Inglehart that I've mentioned before. In my mind, uh, these two books must stay on one shelf and complement each other. Uh, some concepts intersect, for instance, while Engelhardt discusses the shift from pro-fertility norms to individual choice norms, these scholars discuss religious transmission, socialization and childhood autonomy. If you feel that you want to see why polarization is happening and why religion is growing rapidly in some parts of the world while it's declining in other parts, you may want to check Engelhardt. In some chapters, it has more coherent data analysis and interpretation in relation to economy, fertility and existential security. However, if you are interested more in the theoretical framework and how to address the counter-arguments against the theory, in my opinion, you better check beyond doubt. Uh, moreover, here you'll also find a brief history of non-religion and why non-religion is a norm but not an aberration, as well as what it means to live a secular life. Engelhardt on his end provided a bit deeper functionalist approach and demonstrated why it is important to differentiate between various functions of religion and see what functions are indeed fading away and which are more persistent and are more likely to remain even in modernized societies, at least in the near future. Uh, but in that regard I still felt uh, I was lacking in both books a demonstration of how secularization might be not in contrast to religion, but rather a continuation of religion by other means, or the mechanism of how functions of religion are taken over by other social and secular institutions. 
but after mentioning all these, it does not in any sense diminishes the value of the theory or proves its limitations. No, I simply found it important to acknowledge which data or findings, in my humble opinion, could improve the theory and thus protect it from further critique. Sometimes indeed beyond doubt doesn't provide us with a good comprehensive answer to our possible objections, but again, uh, what it does is occasionally the authors simply admit that such and such problem exists and this is where you may find the answers. Uh, to conclude, overall this is an amazing work that sets the bar very high, it provides above satisfactory evidence to demonstrate that the secularization is not resting in peace and must be forgotten as some scholars suggest. Therefore, those who claim that secularization is in the past and we live in the post-secular era must be more careful with their assumptions. Beyond doubt offers arguably the strongest argument to date for the existence of a global secularization trend. Undeniably, this book will be a vital resource for students and scholars alike who study religion and secularism. On the other hand, obviously, the camp of proponents of the post-secularization argument could not be ignored. This camp is represented by a group of very smart, well-respected experts in the field, and they have their own good reasons. Uh, but as we see, Beyond Doubt seriously challenges their position and demands a comprehensive response in the form of a coherent theory. And I think whoever will try to take this challenge will find it extremely hard to refute the secularization theory. But while we wait for it, the proponents of secularization must still work hard on improving their arguments and on finding more data in favor of their position. What we've learned so far is that religion is something highly unpredictable. It's capable of being nimble and it can mutate in all sorts of weird expressions. So maybe it will take another half century or more to say who was right and who was wrong. But even if you are completely disagreeing with the proposed here theory, it's still important to read the book and understand clearly the reasoning of its offers, uh, because what I've shared here is just a fraction of the tons of arguments and data that are presented in the book. Uh, my friends, thank you for watching until the end. I hope I've been able to spark your curiosity, both in this interesting upcoming book and in the topic of secularization. If so, give a like to this video, you may also check some of my other videos, uh, please subscribe to the channel or support it by expressing your appreciation for a one-time donation. You can use the thank you button under this video or send me a couple bucks for PayPal for a cup of coffee. Or you can become my first patron on Patreon, all the links are in the description. Thank you in advance, I wish you peace and health wherever you are.